Asking the right questions can lead to amazing results, and the camera traps reveal nuances about wildlife people could never witness in person. This video will answer how to calculate abundance, relative abundance, and activity. Once we get the cameras back in from the field, we need to get the data and analyze the data so we can answer our questions or test our hypotheses that we made. First, list each species of animals and the number of detections or times that they were spotted. Next, combine all the cameras into one large chart of species and detections. In this chart, we are filling out four different cameras in the first, second, and third week the camera was out in the field. What can you infer from the observations? Looking at this chart here, except for that first day, why do you think there were so many more deer detections than squirrels? There are probably more squirrels in the woods than deer, but the cameras detect larger animals more easily than smaller animals. Squirrels are often also in the trees, where cameras cannot spot them. So try to compare animal populations of a similar body size to remove the camera triggering limitation. It is even better to compare a single animal species in different habitats or different species in the same habitat. Does the data reflect all the species in the area? Plot the number of new species spotted at each camera location. There were four identified animal species at the first location. In the second location, one new species, not seen in the previous group, was identified, and another in the third. The approximate number of species in the area is known when the curve levels off. How does the abundance of animals compare between locations? And so we don't know exactly how many animals are there, but if the cameras are put out in the same way and they're run for the same amount of time, say these cameras are run for three weeks exactly, we can just compare the raw counts. So for Northern Raccoon, on camera number one, we had 14 detections of raccoon over the first three weeks. And on camera number four, we had six detections. And so because we set the cameras out in the same way and they ran the, for three weeks each, we can tell that there's a little over twice as many raccoons at camera number one than camera number four. But in reality, we could see that there are probably twice as many raccoons if they had the same activity pattern. If the cameras we're using to calculate the relative abundance were active in the field for different numbers of days, we have to calculate a relative abundance index instead of using the absolute number of detections. Here we have an example where both camera one and camera two had 30 detections of the eastern gray squirrel. But camera number one was active in the field for 10 days, while camera number two was active in the field for 15 days. We need to calculate the index by dividing the number of detections by the number of days. So camera one detected three squirrels per day, while camera two detected two per day. So the relative abundance shows us that with the same number of detections, we detected one third more on camera number one. This is why relative abundance is so important and should be used unless the time the cameras were working is exactly the same. You can also calculate when species are active. Take the number of detections for an animal and plot it against the time of day. This graph for squirrels shows two peak times in activity throughout the day at 7 a.m. and again at 2 and 4 p.m. To accurately plot activity, you need many observations. At least 20 and more than 50 is better to make an activity graph. You can also make two activity graphs of two different species and compare the two. As you go through the exercises in your class or in this curriculum packet, you are using camera trap data to ask questions just like Smithsonian scientists. We use relative abundance, animal activity, and the presence and absence of animals at cameras to ask if humans are having an impact on wildlife, how wildlife is adapting to those changes, what kind of habitat wildlife needs to survive and thrive, and how we can better manage wildlife into the future. We hope that you've enjoyed this, learned something about wildlife, learned something about science, and keep studying science in the future.